Nick Anderson, teach us something today about billing when your product is an inpatient item. How is that yeah. different? Yeah, let me, I don't know that I'll share slides. So I'll, um, maybe I will in a minute. Let's see kind of where I go with this. But um, in two weeks, I'm speaking at NYU um, to the Department of Interventional Radiology. And uh, they've rented out a restaurant in New York. And I'm going to go speak to that division of NYU Langone Medical Center. And I'll be talking in part about inpatient billing. Inpatient billing is unique. It, if your product is principally going to be used in the inpatient setting, it's just different than outpatient, ambulatory surgical center, uh, physician's office. There's something that everyone should be familiar with called the OBL, the office-based laboratory. Uh, the OBL is, if you ever go to a nice physician's office, big you know, it's not it's not an ambulatory surgical center, but it's bigger than an office. And you walk down the hallway and they open the doors and it looks like a little mini surgical suite. That's an OBL. Uh, where physicians say, I still want my office where I can come in and check you out and, you know, see if you got melanoma, you know, see how your shoulder's doing, whatever, whatever their specialty is. But should I need to operate in a mini operation where lidocaine and maybe a little, uh, you know, Xanax will do the trick as far as anesthesia is concerned. Let's go down the hallway to the OBL, the office-based laboratory, and I'll treat you in there. From a reimbursement perspective, OBLs and offices are paid the same. So Medicare, Aetna, Cigna, they don't care. They go, it's an office. You just have this fancy little surgical suite in there. Um, but we pay you the same as if it was just in the office. So in all the settings of care, you've got the inpatient setting, the hospital outpatient department, as we call the HOPD, hospital outpatient department, uh, the ambulatory surgical center, the physician's office and the OBL and the ASC and a smattering of others. There, there's actually a list. If you want to, in a minute, you can Google Medicare settings of care. And there's a list that'll come up on Medicare's website. And it's like a hundred. One of them is a helicopter uh, because of life flight type, <clears throat> type helicopter things. That's a setting of care. And there's certain things that Medicare won't pay for if the patient's treated in the helicopter. Um, another one is an ambulance. If your medical device is principally used in the ambulance, um, there's a client of mine based out of France who has a medical device that's used in the ambulance because they can hurry and treat you in the ambulance if you've had a ischemic stroke or a heart attack or whatever it is, and they can get you really stabilized before you get to the hospital. And they have evidence that if, if their device is used in the ambulance, that the chances of <clears throat> serious morbidity and mortality at the hospital decreases. Um, well, Medicare says, sorry, we only pay for this, this, and this in the ambulance. So you got to prove to us that that setting of care is meaningful, um, that you have evidence that it can, can be used in the ambulance. It should be used in the ambulance. It improves patient outcomes if used in the ambulance and so on. So this list of settings of care is astonishing. And they each have a number. So there's site of service 11, there's site of service 24, there's site of service 20, there's site of service whatever. Well, that site of service needs to go on the bill when the bill goes to the insurance company and they go, wait, you did a heart transplant in a helicopter? Yeah, we don't pay for that. <laughs> you know, don't, don't ever do that again to our member. Um, Why should that matter? Um, I don't know, Joe. I don't know if it's a historical thing that, it mattered in 1974 and now it's just run away and is now this thing. There's probably some logic to it. I haven't spent too much time thinking about why it would matter. There's a, there's a big question amongst reimbursement and health economics people regarding when Medicare is finally gonna do site neutral payments and say, we don't care where you treat our member, just, send us the bill and if it works, it works. Why do we care if it's the hospital or the ASC? We pay you $10,000. So 
So you guys choose where you want to do the, the surgery. If you're doing a heart transplant in a helicopter, um, then it's on you for malpractice if something goes wrong. Clearly, you didn't have everything you needed when you did the heart transplant up in the helicopter. Um, that's not our fault. You send us the bill. If everything works out well, we send you the $100,000 for the heart transplant. So that's something everybody can keep their eye on. I'm sure all of us have email subscriptions that come to us, you know, from uh, Becker's or from, you know, any of these email things that we all get. Keep your eye out for site neutral payments uh, over the next several years. Just make it a thing that's in the back of your head, like, hey, what's Medicare and Aetna and Cigna and all of them doing with site neutral payments? And just keep an eye out for it because we were wondering if they were going to, if Medicare was going to do this during the latest rule re release. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but they didn't. So Medicare puts out a rule in the spring and a final rule in the summer for the inpatient billing. And then they do another rule in the summer and a, a proposed rule and a final rule in the fall for everything else. And so people that are in health economics and market access are on bated breath every, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, about four times a year, one for the inpatient, in, inpatient proposed rule and the inpatient final rule, and one for the outpatient proposed rule and one for the outpatient final rule. So four times a year, we all sit at our computers, and I'm not kidding you, on the, on the, government's website, the Code of Federal Regulations, we are hitting refresh every few hours to mm -hmm. see if the rule has left CMS and gone to the OMB and left the OMB and is now posted on the Federal Register to see if there's like, hey, the final rule is out. Well, when the final rule came out, um, a f well, it wasn't in the final rule. It was in another set of rules. Sorry, I don't mean to make it too complicated, but... Um, a major medical device company, I don't know if all of you have heard of them. It's not a Boston Scientific Medtronic. It's not major like that, but they're still a, a multi-billion dollar company. Their stock dropped 75, 73% in three hours. They lost $350 million in market cap between 9 a.m. and noon because Medicare said, hey, we're now going to pay for this. We're now going to include other procedures where these guys had kind of a unique little thing saying, hey, we only treat these patients and we're the only ones who can do it. And Medicare said, nah, we're going to lump everything in together, which took away their uniqueness. They lost $350 million in market cap in three hours. And um, I mean, it was devastating. They still haven't recovered. I keep checking to see if like, okay, everyone has a bad day, but then you know, they're back. No, they're still down here. And this has been over a month. So these rules that are released by Medicare, the IPPS, which is the inpatient prospective payment system, and the OPPS, physician fee schedule and ambulatory surgical fee schedule, they all usually come out at the same time. Those rules, they can kill you. I mean, you've been developing your medical device for two years, you've got FDA, you you know, everything's going really well. And you go, we're in this unique thing over here, which is why we developed the company, we're trying to solve a problem. Then Medicare comes out and says, oh, by the way, you're now not going to be in this payment category, you're going to be in this payment category. And you go, well, I don't, what are we supposed to do now? You know, we just got in big trouble. So let me kind of put a, a pause there. If, are there any questions? Yeah, this is one about um, outside the U.S. If what you're saying applies, yes, in Asia Pacific, especially Asia Pacific has relatively the same inpatient billing scenario that we have. Um, in Europe, it's analogous, but it's not exactly the same. But I know for Aus uh, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, Southeast Asia, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, all of that, Japan, Korea, follows very much the same rules as we follow in, um, in America for outpatient billing. So all I've talked about so far is kind of the, oh, sorry, Gunjan. 
Nick, uh, my question was slightly different. I was asking about Medicare payments if the procedure is performed outside of the borders of the U.S. Say you are traveling to Mexico, you know, or you are on a cruise, or, uh, you know, you, like if you look at the U.K. Health Service, they will actually fund procedures performed in another country in in a way to as a way to save costs for example so i was wondering if any of that thought process is going on at medicare yeah very good question so there there's something called failed access where the insurance companies will say nick anderson needed a shoulder replacement mm -hmm. within the network so for medicare it's the united states um, but for commercial payers, it's these 12 hospitals around where I live. If I go outside of that, the insurance company receives the bill and goes, okay, why didn't Nick go to one of the in-network hospitals? And I say, well, and my doctor says, well, he needed a unique type of shoulder replacement because Nick's a diabetic and he's obese and he smokes and he's, his shoulder has this unique thing and he's got this polymorphic, he, the guy's a disaster. We're the only hospital that does it. Nick lives in Utah. He had to go to Texas for this surgery. Right. The insurance company will say, we beg to differ. There's plenty of hospitals in Utah that were capable of doing that procedure. This is now considered out of network. So instead of Nick's copay being this much, it's going to be this much. Hey, Nick, you should have checked with us before you ran off to another place to get your surgery done. In terms of like medical tourism, which I'm actually a huge fan of. Um, go to Thai. If you need a knee replacement, go to Thailand, go to Bangalore. Um, you're going to get the same knee that was FDA approved in those countries maybe years ago um, and get a much better experience. The best dental work I ever received was in Chiang Mai, Thailand right. um, by a dentist who was trained in Michigan. <laughs> you know, that um, it was, it was incredible that I'm a big fan of medical tourism, but insurance companies aren't. Insurance companies will say, why did you have to go to Mexico to get this done? Um, that is not failed access. You just, you know, you had other ulterior motives for going there, uh, like stem cell injections and things. I know a lot of people that go to Mexico for stem cell treatments. Yep. The insurance companies say, don't send us the bill. If that was medically necessary, we would be offering it at the hospital down the street from your house. Right. But why do we not pay for that? Because the evidence stinks. And that's why you got to go off to some other country or, you know, the Bahamas or something and be treated. If you were on a cruise ship and you got sick and you needed to be treated, they do consider that anything in, in the emergency space is covered. Insurance companies go, you couldn't help that you got appendicitis on your cruise you know, you had to be treated in the Bahamas. That's fine. Send us the bill. We pay for it. Or you had a stroke or a heart attack. We don't expect you to come back to Utah to be treated. So for medical tourism, it's different. The insurance companies go, if it worked, we would be paying for it here. The reason why we don't pay for it is because the evidence stinks. And the only places that are willing to do it are outside of the U.S. It's a little bit of a pretentious view. That, um, you know, that, you know, what do you think they can't do great medical therapies in other places? But the insurance company, I think, would say that's not our argument. Our argument is that if you needed a stem cell injection into your shoulder for arthritis, and if the evidence was good that that worked and had good durability of effect, that would be in our medical policy and you could get it anywhere. The reason why it's not offered here is because it doesn't work and we don't pay for it. Right. That's why you have to go off to, you know, some other place to have it done. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. So just to talk real quick about the inpatient in particular. Inpatient several years ago was redefined from 24 hours in the hospital. or It was like 23 hours and 50 minutes or some some goofy definition. It was redefined to two midnights in the hospital. The patient literally has to be in the hospital for two midnights. So if the guy showed up at 12.04 a.m., he missed the first midnight. And the doctor comes and checks him out. He's gasping for air. Something's terribly wrong. The doctor says, hey, let's admit him. 
and that's 1227 AM, you've missed the first midnight by 27 mi minutes. You now have to stay, what, almost three days to hit those two midnights. So the, the patient has to be admitted for two midnights. That is the actual legal definition of inpatient. Um, <clears throat> now, let's say you've got a, a, your, your appendix ruptured and there's a concern that you're septic and you know, you're, you're older, maybe you have prediabetes, something, whatever it is. There, there's a bunch of factors that's making them keep you an extra long time. Where normally they'd say, you know what, we deal with this all the time. We're going to keep you for a day and a half. But given who you are and your disaster state, we're going to keep you for three or four days because there's a risk of sepsis and, you know, you lost blood, hypo, hypovolemia and so on. So let's keep you for several days. Well, during that episode of care, another term everybody should know, <clears throat> uh, like site of service and site neutral payments, um, there is, they're going to treat you with a series of treatments. They're going to do an appendicitis. They're going, uh, appendectomy, excuse me. They're going to do an appendectomy. They're going to uh, let's say they do 10 different procedures on you. Each of those procedures is called an ICD-10 PCS code. So International Classification of Diseases, 10th edition, uh, procedural coding system. So everyone should be really generally familiar with ICD-10 PCS. If you ever hear of a PCS code, you instantly go, okay, this guy was inpatient. So, and they go, your friends, you know, at dinner as you razzle and dazzle them with your reimbursement knowledge, they go, how did you know that was an inpatient stay? And you say, well, because it's a PCS code. You only use those if the guy's inpatient. So Nick Anderson shows up, he weighs a thousand pounds. He smokes like a chimney, drinks Coke all day long. His appendix ruptures. He's, they're fearful that I'm septic. And I get there at 11.59 PM. They admit me. Just in the nick of time, you know, he, we got that first midnight. We do surgery on him by 1 a.m. He stays, you know, the second midnight. Now it's officially inpatient. Now the doctor goes over to the EMR and starts either speaking into a, a microphone and it dictates, or let's say it's the old fashioned way and he writes it out. And he says, okay, I did this procedure on him. Then I, seven hours later, I did this procedure. Seven hours later, I did this procedure. 20 minutes later, I did this procedure. Each one of those is an ICD-10 PCS code and they're alphanumeric. Um, so six, there's six letters, let's see, seven. There's seven letters and numbers. And each one of those in their respective place. So let's say it's one, two, three, four, A, B, C. One means this, two means this, three means this, A means this, and so on. And so the first procedure he did to me was an appendectomy. So that's one, two, three, four, A, B, C. Then six hours later, they treated me for a deep vein thrombosis because man, this guy's a wreck. Now he's got a DVT because he's been laying in bed and you know his blood's clotted because of the anesthetic or whatever. Well, that's two, three, four, five, D, E, F. So he's gonna put that on the bill. And then they had to treat me for a migraine because I got a major headache. Well, they're gonna put that on the bill and they're gonna send all those to, the, to my insurance company. On the bill, they have to put the principal diagnosis. So why did Nick show up? Did Nick show up for, for appendicitis or did he show up for a migraine? Well, no, I showed up for appendicitis. The reason, the principal diagnosis, what, it, what, what it's called, the principal diagnosis is why did Nick come to the emergency room tonight? He, he, he ended up with a DVT, he ended up with a migraine, and he had appendicitis. But of those three, the reason why he came was appendicitis. That is vitally important. I, I'm, I cannot tell you the number of discussions I have on a daily basis, not a weekly basis, on a daily basis where this is the most confusing thing for sales reps. Because the sales reps are going to the hospital and saying, 
hey, if you use our medical device, uh, there's a very good chance you'll get paid this way. And the doctor and hospital's value analysis committee says, well, what if the patient came in for something else, a thing for which your product's not principally used? And they go, uh, I don't know. And then they call me and I have to go, guys, it's, it depends on the principal diagnosis. So <clears throat> let's say this medical device is designed for pulmonary embolism. And the patient shows up with a principal diagnosis of, of pulmonary embolism. Then the insurance company receives the bill. Let's say this is the only ICD-10 PCS code they get. You know, let's, let's just make it simple. Nick has a pulmonary embolism, which is ICD-10 CM. CM is clinical management, I think. International Classification of Diseases, 10th edition, clinical management. Nick has a, has a pulmonary embolism. That code is I26.9. It's always a, a letter and then two numbers and then typically a decimal and another number. So on the bill, they'll write I26.9 was the principal diagnosis, which is pulmonary embolism. Then we used you know, this medical device on him. And this medical device is designed to treat pulmonary embolism. We did that in the inpatient setting. So that's going to be 02 FP blah, blah, blah. The insurance company gets this in conjunction with the principal diagnosis and they go, yep, perfectly reasonable. Now they map that to a DRG, a term I'm sure most of you have already heard, a diagnosis related grouping. When DRGs first came out 30 years ago, there were about 500 of them. DRG number one is heart transplant. It literally is. So it's DRG 001. It's always three numbers. 001 is heart transplant. 002 is something. 003, all the way up to 500. Um, spine fusions in there. Um, uh, hysterectomies in there. You know, all these different things. Um, there's now nearly 1,000 of them. So it started with 500 and then it just kept growing to about a thousand different DRGs. Well, when ICD-10-CM says Nick has a pulmonary embolism, he was treated with this thing, which is 02F blah, 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 blah. They go, yep, that's an appropriate therapy for that diagnosis. We're happy to pay for that. Now their algorithm routes those two codes to a DRG. And they say, okay, that's DRG one, two, three. DRG123 pays this much money. Here's your money. That's all you get. Now, what if they did 10 different ICD-10 PCS procedures on me? Because again, I got a DVT, I got a migraine, I got all these other things. They go, great, thank you. Send us all of that. We put that into our algorithm and we reimburse DRG456. That pays $40,000. Here's your money. Now, the hospital goes... Aetna, it cost us $65,000 to treat your disastrous member. He was obese, he smokes, you know, so on and so forth. It cost us $65,000. You're only reimbursing us $40,000 because that's all that DRG pays. And they go, yep. And the hospital goes, well, we need an extra $15,000. And they go, no, you don't. You need to get better at practicing medicine. Hmm. Click. And now the hospital's attorneys can call the insurance company's attorneys and they can duke it out in a, in a arbitration appeals process where the hospital says, it's not our fault, your member. Now all of a sudden it's your member, right? So all of you have heard, who have heard me speak for 10 years now, you, you always hear me say, the patient belongs to the insurance company. They do not belong to the hospital and the physician. And nothing, this is always evident when you think of reimbursement. If the patient belonged to the physician, why are they asking to get reimbursed? And secondly, you really see this when the hospital doesn't get paid what they want. All of a sudden, it's your child, right? Like, th this is your member. And you go, oh, interesting, because you've always been saying it's my patient until all of a sudden there's some pushback. And now it's all of a sudden the insurance company's member. Well, that's my assertion. That's always been my assertion. The patient belongs to the health insurance company. The physician's job is to treat the insurance company member. They're not, they don't belong to them. So um, the, the physician treats the patient. They put on the bill a whole bunch of ICD-10 PCS codes. 
That bill goes to the insurance company. The insurance company puts it into an algorithm and says, okay, for appendicitis or for pulmonary embolism, uh, you look at these different codes, the algorithm churns and it spits out a DRG. And that DRG is 729 or 462 or whatever. And that pays this much money and here's your check. So that covers everything. That covers every gauze pad, uh, Ed Lynn's nasal cannula, face mask, the, all the disposables, um, that covers everything. Here's the payment you get, end of discussion. And now if the hospital doesn't like that, if the hospital says, you know, we need more money than that, well, then that's up to the Department of Critical Care or the Department of Orthopedic Surgery or something to say, why do we keep getting underpaid for this? Is it the Pupu Kaka Insurance Company or is it us? Are we using the Rolls Royce of medical devices? Are we using, are we too profligate in our use of gauze pads? And so the bill we're sending to the insurance company is way higher than what we'll ever get paid. Maybe we need to tighten up things here a little bit. We know that for a shoulder replacement, we're only gonna get $50,000. So what striker artificial shoulder are we using? Oh, well, we use the premium gold plated one. And they go, okay, how much is that? Well, it's 35,000. Okay, so that leaves us $15,000. What else are we doing? Well, we're doing seven MRIs and two CAT scans. Okay, are you using gadolinium in, in that MRI? Yeah, how much is that? Oh, that's another 5,000 bucks. Okay, now it's only 10,000 that we're gonna get paid. So maybe we need to tighten things up here. Maybe we need to look at who our vendors are. Do we need the gold-plated shoulder replacement or could we do with something different, something worse? Because if we keep losing money out of our DRG payments, we're in big trouble. Berna? Uh, so yeah, so my question, um, Nick, was, so it sounds like part of the problem, it sounds like there's a rule that only one DRG can be used per inpatient um, situation. So is that is that true? Yeah, yeah very good question. Oh, let me continue with my analogy. This is an analogy I am using in the real world in real time right now um, on this computer. <clears throat> Let's say a woman shows up to give birth and um, totally normal. Everything's healthy. The woman's healthy. Everything's great. She shows up to the hospital and I go, okay, today's your big day. Let's get you into labor and delivery. You're going to have this baby in the next hour. She gives birth to the baby. Everyone's happy. Grandma and grandpa are thrilled. And seven hours later, she's gasping for air. Her blood pressure plummets. She's blacking out and they go, oh my gosh, she's got a pulmonary embolism. She threw a blood clot from her leg or from her abdomen up into her lung. She's gasping for air. She's got a PE. Why did the woman come to the hospital? It was for vaginal, it was for a labor and delivery. It was, I don't know what the ICD-10 CM code would be, but it would be pregnancy, let's just say. Um, as a consequence of labor and delivery, she accidentally got a pulmonary embolism. Since that's not the primary di diagnosis, it's the secondary diagnosis. So there is room to put primary diagnosis, labor and delivery, or a, a pregnancy, secondary diagnosis, uh, pulmonary embolism, tertiary diagnosis, diabetic. We didn't know the woman was diabetic when she came in. We didn't even think to check. We had to rush her into labor and delivery. She ended up getting a pulmonary embolism. Well, since the primary diagnosis was pregnancy, and the principal treatment was labor and delivery, that's the DRG that's going to be paid. So let's say the hospital used a $20,000 medical device to treat her, her pulmonary embolism. They're going to be upside down. So um, the, the DRG that would be paid, I actually know the DRG, it's 805. Um, it's vaginal delivery without dilation and curatage with major complication and comorbidity. In other words, a normal vaginal delivery, but the woman had an MCC. She had a major complication of comorbidity. So the, that DRG pays like $10,000 or something like that. Then there's DRG 806, which is vaginal delivery without dilation curatage uh, with major, comp uh, 
um, with complication and comorbidity. And then the next one, DRG 807, is all of that with no complication and comorbidity, just a normal, happy baby delivery. So that first one, DRG 805, is designed to reimburse for these disaster labor and deliveries where the woman gets a pulmonary embolism, she hemorrhages and they have to put a, an IV of blood in her and so on. Um, but it's not going to reimburse for a $40,000 pulmonary embolism device. Because again, it only pays this much money. I don't know what it is, 10,000 bucks, 15,000 bucks or something. So the hospital has to go, we need to fix our clinical programs. Because in the last year, we've had three women give birth and have a pulmonary embolism. So department chair of OBGYN, department chair of so-and-so and so-and-so, and so, and so, we all need to have a meeting. Um, are we checking women for diabetes when they come in, no matter how far along they are in their labor? I mean, they could be dilated to a nine. You need to be checking their blood, their HbA1c. You need to be checking their blood glucose. Um, you need to get a blood pressure cuff on that woman immediately. Uh, hey, I'm not a doctor. Should we be giving every woman having a baby, you know, a blood thinner? You know, awful idea, but let's just say, right? And the doctors go, no, awful idea. Don't do that. Okay, okay. Then let's not give every woman in vaginal labor. Uh, I say vaginal because I'm meaning not C-sections, right? Okay, we can't do that. Let's work out something because we need to fix this three times in one year where the national average is one time a year. We're doing terribly. Now, why should we fix this? Well, one, our DRG payment's not going to compensate us for the, those expensive devices we have to use to treat the pulmonary embolism, like mechanical thrombectomy or something terrible, something like that, something expensive like that. <clears throat> Um, the other reason why is the insurance companies, when they renegotiate contracts with our hospital, are going to say, guys, St. John's Hospital only has one PE a year for vaginal delivery. St. Mark's Hospital only has one. You guys have three? Like, here's what we're going to do. We're only going to reimburse you this DRG, this amount of money, till you guys get your act together. And we're going to encourage all of our pregnant members to go to those hospitals. I, 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 I had this discussion less than 24 hours ago. I had this exact discussion less than 24 hours ago. It wasn't about labor and delivery, so it's not exact, but um, a question came up, why do hospitals care about value? Do they really care? I mean, a value is this discussion and value to this guy isn't value to this guy. And value to the insurance companies isn't value over here. And that question came up and I said, do you mind if I answer the question? And I said, yes, hospitals care about value because when it comes time for that hospital to renegotiate their contracts with Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross, United Healthcare, those insurance companies are gonna open up big spreadsheets created by their actuaries and they're gonna go, well, every time one of our members comes to your hospital, they come away with C. diff. Every time one of our members goes to your hospital, they come away with a migraine. Every time one of our members goes to your hospital, they get a pulmonary embolism. So here's the deal. We're going to pay that hospital 10,000 bucks. We're going to pay you 8,000. We're going to do everything we can to route our members from the bad hospital to the good hospital. So you guys need to hire better doctors. You need to tighten up your clinical programs. You need to come up with something because, Verna, to your question, like, here's all the ICD-10 PCS codes that you guys did. You did 10. On average, we get five. You guys are just blowing money all over the place. And we only reimburse this DRG, DRG-123. And DRG-123 pays 10,000 bucks. So you got to tighten this up. Once we see the your comorbidities and all these terrible things get in check and you guys have improved things, maybe we'll pay your DRG 11,000. Now, Medicare doesn't do that. Medicare punishes you in other ways. Um, but on the commercial front, they can go, we love that hospital down there. Those guys are awesome. Our, pay, our members never get C. diff. Our members never come away with 
sepsis. They never come away with migraines and all these things. Again, everybody, you got to understand, I'm speaking very stylistically, right? That, um, you know, when they go to that hospital, they get really good outcomes. Um, the DRG covers the expense. Um, we're happy when they go there. When they go to that hospital down there, it's a wreck. And so we're going to punish them. We're not going to pay $10,000 for the same DRG we pay them. We're going to pay $9,000. And that hospital better get its act together, hire better doctors, tighten up their clinical programs, and uh, stop being so profligate with every gauze pad and syringe they want to use. Sorry, I'm not monitoring the chat. Joe or... Erna asked whether or not this DRG data is available for purchase. And I said, I believe that LexisNexis sells it. They yeah. taught some uh, workshops at 10X some years back. Yeah, and Verna, it's, it's dependent on the geographic locale of the hospital. There's something, I don't know if the, it's called the GYPSI, the Geographic Practice Cost Index, but um, a hospital in downtown New York is gonna get paid different than a hospital in downtown Lincoln, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Um, they'll get $10,000. They're going to get $7,000 because of the property expense and utilities and all that. So it, it, that is factored. I know that's factored in in physician payment. I don't know about DRGs, but I'm assuming as much. Um, you can download the IPP, uh, excuse me, the IPPS fee schedule. You can go to CMS's website download the inpatient prospective payment system fee schedule, and you can see DRG1 pays this much money, DRG2 pays this much, DRG3 and so on for all 1,000 of those. Now there's some gaps in there. Um, you know, maybe DRG624 is blank because DRG624 was something and now nobody does it anymore, so Medicare just gets rid of it. So there'll be DRG623, 625, 626, 627. So there's about a thousand of them with some blanks in there. Um, but I wanna, in just this last couple of minutes, we can open it up for questions and maybe there's already some, but it, it's worth everybody knowing the mechanics as I just described. What is the principal diagnosis for the patient? Why did they come to the hospital? I don't care all the other things that happened to them, why were they principally there? They were principally there for a pulmonary embolism or to give birth. Whatever else happens during the episode of care is the secondary and tertiary diagnosis. Then what were all the procedures done while the guy was there for two midnights? Those are all the ICD-10 PCS codes. The diagnosis code and the PCS codes are all gonna go to the insurance company. Their algorithm's gonna say, okay, based off that diagnosis code, and based off of these 20 different PCS codes, here's the DRG we're gonna pay. We, we're gonna pay DRG 123. DRG 123 pays $19,000. Here's your $19,000. Now, there are exceptions. There's outlier status. If the patient's truly a disaster and they have to stay there for 30 days, that's, that's inpatient billing 201. We can talk about that another time, but generally speaking, uh, this is how it works. You have to think about where this device is going to be used. This is the device Michelle just got you FDA clearance for, and uh, Joe Hage is doing the marketing for, and Nick Anderson's doing the reimbursement for, and so on. And you go, what setting of care is this principally going to be used? In the, in the life flight helicopter, in the ambulance, in the outpatient setting, in the ASC, in the doctor's office, in the OBL? or in the inpatient setting. And you go, well, nine times out of 10, this is inpatient. Okay, then you're never gonna get a HCPCS code for it, the, the product code for reimbursement. You're never gonna get it. They won't issue you a new product reimbursement code for this. So what if this is used 99% of the time inpatient? The hospital can't bill separately for it unless they have something called NTAP, new technology add-on payment. If they can get NTAP for this, then they get the $10,000 DRG payment plus 2,000 for this. There is nothing that is a bigger adrenaline shot to your product than getting NTAP. Um, if you can get NTAP in the inpatient setting, 
or TPT in the outpatient setting, buckle up. You're going to make a ton of money. So Brian um, is nodding along with you. Brian, um, how does this relate to your business? I'm, I, uh, a prior business, we did look at the NTAP. And I tell you, it is an explosive process if you garner getting an NTAP. It's one of those things where, you know, in a prior business I was looking at and we were, I was sitting down with my principals and executives and, and, and looking at how do you restructure your organization? Because it just, blood, it, it, it blows the flood gate, floodgates off of your business. So what was your category? Perspective, but then from an infrastructure standpoint, you, you could probably have some headaches, which well, is your category is, before. I'm sorry. What was your category? Um, so this was a, a inner body core fusion implants. Um, we were looking at an end tap due to the fact of a, a special uh, uh, surface that we were putting on our um, our. Um, we had a we had a section X ICD ten code, but then we were we had another surface technology we we're looking to incorporate on um, on spinal implants that uh, we were then trying to uh, garner uh, end tap recognition. Mm. Nick, if I'm a hospital trying to maximize my profit and Joe Hage, the patient, shows up at 11.59, would I advise the person at the desk to hold off on checking him in until 12.01 or book him now? So, yeah, it would, it, if you, it, it depends. Inpatient doesn't always pay you more money necessarily. But um, it seems as though it does because you look at the IPPS fee schedule and you look at the OPPS fee schedule and you're like, man, those look bigger than this one. It looks like you make more money in the inpatient setting. But a physician could get in big trouble, one, for, you know, Medicare fraud type thing and being like, hey, hurry and admit everybody who comes in so that we can route everybody. But there's a not only is it a bad idea to do it, it may be a, they're going to admit them no matter what. It just depends whether or not the patient stays for two midnights. Let me rephrase how I just said that. No, no, if I the think guy, that you want an, a midnight under your belt. Yeah, you do. Because if that guy has to stay another like six or seven hours, you know, now he's got diarrhea or now he's got a fever and you go, Ooh, good thing I admitted him before that first midnight, because now he's certainly going to be here another midnight. So now I'm insured of getting a re a, a typically higher paying inpatient payment than an outpatient payment. So the answer is yes. Get them before midnight if you can. Yeah. Okay. Again, I don't know how many people are actually playing that game. I mean, like I said, what I'm saying is a little stylistic. There's not a doctor waiting on bated breath at the ambulance bay being like, uh, okay, oh, admit me you know, like everyone get out of the way. What's your name, yeah. sir? Let me check you in here. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I think also that's where doctors go. I don't care about the money stuff. I'm here to practice medicine. If I need to admit the guy, I'm going to admit him. If I don't need to, I'm not going to. When I'm done with him, he can go home. And there's probably someone wearing a suit that's like, uh, could you keep the guy maybe another 20 minutes so that we can do this? Again, that's stylistic. I don't know that you know anyone's actually doing that in the real world, but maybe. I mean, I've heard of stranger things, but... I know that um, you are a fan favorite, so just putting your name on the marquee tends to have a lift in attendance. I mean, Thank Bert you. had other things to do today, but he made time for you. But I'm curious, how relevant day-to-day -day is this topic of inpatient or not to our audience today? It, uh, just it, depend it depends on the product you're working on. On this computer over here, I talk about it every single day. It, it is a major issue because some products, you know darn well that this product for this disease, the patient should be in and out in 12 hours, but isn't it a mystery when we look at the data and the patient's been there 36 hours and you're like, hmm, something's going on. I know what our competition's doing I know precisely what they're telling doctors and hospitals and value analysis committees, because when their sales rep leaves the VAC meeting and our sales rep shows up and they go, hey, let us tell you what this guy just said. And you go, ooh, can I get that in writing? I mean, 
the, it, I encourage you to consider, you know, wink, wink, doing such and such. I mean, it's dog eat dog. I have this product. You have this product. They both do practically the exact same thing. And, and $700 million a year of revenue is up for grabs. And my bonus is up for grabs. And um, if this is used inpatient, the hospital is going to make 10 grand. If it's used outpatient, they're only going to make in the OPPS about six grand. Um, yeah, you know that this stuff is real. I mean, the the street fights that are going on, especially when your product is in a world where there's diminishing returns, that the hospitals are going. I need a product that does the job that doesn't eat my entire DRG. Uh, every time I use your product, it costs me twenty five hundred bucks. Typically, when I'm using this product, it's one of these four or five, six different DRGs that only pay between 10 grand and 15 grand. I can't use your product. You're just too expensive. You eat too much of my DRG. I, I need a product that is good enough. And this is happening more and more. Insurance premiums, this was released yesterday. Insurance premiums are expected to go up 6.5% next year. Six and a half percent, all of our premiums are going up next year. I mean, hospitals are, are, are that's going to trickle out somehow. That's not going to result in higher reimbursements for hospitals. I have the feeling. Um, this is, this is where hospitals start to get the squeeze and go, I need good products that are reasonably priced. The days of the Rolls Royce products are behind us. 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, awesome. Now, I haven't even talked about the conversion factor and how that plays into things, but um, I need good products that don't eat my DRG, Joe. And if you've brought me this Rolls-Royce product and you've priced it to the moon because you still think it's 2006, I, I can't do it. I want what's best for my patients here in this hospital when it comes time to renegotiate contracts with the insurance companies, I want to show really good outcomes. So I need a really good device that, that provides me good outcomes measures for the insurance companies to give me good paying payments. But I can't pay for the Rolls Royce products because there's a diminishing return and the insurance companies aren't going to pay me 50 grand for the DRG. They used to be paying me 10 grand for Um I need a good enough product. Mm -hmm. Are you providing me a good enough product? And you go, yeah, I'm providing you a Rolls Royce product. Well, great. I'm willing to pay. I'm real. I'm willing to pay for the Toyota Corolla for the Rolls Royce product. And you go, I can't do that. My venture capitalist won't let me do that. My board of directors won't let me do that. And they go, eh, not my problem. I need a good product that's reasonably priced. Uh, in closing, I'll probably be reaching you. Um, most of you on the call know Paula Rutledge. Uh, an executive recruiter based out of Florida and uh, a friend of our family. Um, she came to me yesterday with a German-based diagnostic for uh, rapid early detection of Alzheimer's and dementia, just getting cleared uh, by FDA and uh, coming to market. And I said, Nick's gonna be all over that. Um, so we'll talk about that. Uh, Rob is our featured guest next week. Rob, uh, what are we going to be talking about? Next week, we're going to be talking about U.S. agents and how to pick them. And why is that relevant right now? Every year, October 1st, you have to renew your registration with the FDA. And everybody waits until after October 1st to do anything. But if you have a registrar currently and you don't like them if you wait until oct after october 1st you're going to end up paying their fee if you do the change now um most of the u.s agents will oh yeah we'd love to have your business we'll ch help you switch over to our u.s agent and we'll only charge you for fiscal year 2024 not for the few weeks remaining in 2023 but that makes now is the time to make all the updates to your listing Now's the time to update your U.S. agent, change your address, do all that stuff before they lock the the uh, database and say you have to pay your fee before you can make a change. 
enough. So we'll talk about the timing and the role and uh, the good and the bad of the folks in the industry. So thank you for that. Uh, Gunjan signed up to tell us about India sometime in uh, October, and I'm hoping to get uh, somebody to talk to us uh, about uh, this being um, Sepsis Awareness Month. So uh, good programming coming up. Thank you for everyone for contributing. Good to see some less familiar, less frequent faces. And uh, I'll see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks, Nick.